You know, out of every engine that's available for game creation right now, Roblox has always been the one that's been the most interesting to me. It's super hands-on and doesn't really require that much knowledge on how to create games to really get going in its software, which has led to this platform being used for an uncountable amount of projects made by people of varying age ranges. These games obviously varying in quality depending on who's making them, but some devs have gotten really creative with this engine's utilization, making things that would seem impossible from an outsider's perspective. And if you take a look at the genres of games you can play on this site, I feel like one of, if not the most inconsistent one, has to be the horror genre. And it makes sense. Roblox is, at the end of the day, a kid's game. Mascot horror and other adjacent, tamer genres in this niche are going to be what takes center stage for horror projects made with this software. But the way this limitation is utilized can either breed mediocrity or sometimes manage to completely redefine others' impressions on what this software is capable of. These are all things I have talked about before, but that was almost half a year ago, and let me tell ya, a lot has happened in those few months. I don't know if my standards have just been lowered, or if I'm simply going insane, but this weird niche of internet horror has absolutely enthralled me since I last touched on this topic, to the point where the Roblox game Apirophobia was actually what inspired me to play every single Backrooms game on Steam, and reporting back, the Roblox game somehow managed to do a better job than 90% of the offerings presented on the genuine game storefront. But let's talk about our core cast of games real quick. Last time, we covered the games Piggy, Doors, and Rainbow Friends. Since then, all of these games have gotten pretty big content updates. Doors finally got its Hotel Plus update, which heavily changed how the game is played, with pretty good balancing changes that add to the overall fun factor, as well as its very own super hard mode. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. On the other side of things, Rainbow Friends got an out-of-nowhere announcement for its second chapter that nobody actually expected to come out, and it was actually kind of okay. And finally, Piggy collabed with Metallica, what? Since there really isn't anything else to talk about regarding Piggy compared to the other games we previously covered, let's take a fast detour to briefly talk about this weird phenomenon I've noticed with Roblox games lately where Metallica is just there for some reason. So this is my understanding. Back in April, Metallica partnered with five big Roblox games for an event to promote their new album, 72 Seasons. All of these games being big horror games on the site with one exception. Now, I don't know who Metallica thinks their audience is, but this has to be one of the strangest collaborations I have ever seen happen for a video game. And it's not like it's even that out of the ordinary for a band to do partnerships for games like this too. Like, just this month for example, it got announced that Slipknot and Iron Maiden DLCs were coming to Dead by Daylight. But I feel a DVD player is more likely to be listening to My Plague while slashing people as Albert Wesker than the hypothetical scenario of Timmy on his mom's iPad rocking out to Damage Inc. while playing Roblox Piggy. Obviously, no shade to the devs who took this offer, or even to Metallica for doing it. Do I think it's strange? Absolutely. But it did mean new limited time content for the players of these games, so either way, that's still pretty cool. Other than that, though, there's not really much to talk about regarding Piggy. I didn't want this video to just be covering two updates of games we have already previously covered, though. So, in place of Piggy, I wanted to check out another Roblox horror game that was recommended to me non-stop after the the first video I made. The Mimic. No, not that Mimic. Anyways. The Mimic is something that, when going in, I had absolutely no prior knowledge of. But after playing, I can certainly see why this is recommended to me as aggressively as it was. Let's just get it out of the way. The Mimic is one of the most technically impressive Roblox games I have ever looked at. The lighting is absolutely fantastic, along with the environments and level design. My only criticism about most of these sprawling, beautiful environments is that you barely get to see them. For some reason, this game really likes blurring out everything that isn't directly in front of you. I don't know if this is done to save on resources, but it turns some areas that would have otherwise been absolutely stunning for Roblox to more watered-down versions of the same concept. I understand why they would have this effect, especially for a horror game, but it does kind of take me out of the experience from time to time. The Mimic as of right now has one and a half campaigns. The first storyline and saga of chapters are complete, with the second one still ongoing and being updated. And to say that you can see the improvement between 
between the chapters, I think is a little bit of an understatement. The Mimic's whole concept revolves around Japanese folklore and ghosts. And if I were to give another positive for this game, it's that it feels strangely very authentically Japanese. Down to the environments, to the monsters, and everything in between. The game really feels like it did its homework, which makes the use of the setting feel a lot more genuine than I would have ever guessed it to. Now, we can sit here and gander at pretty visuals all day, but this is a game we're talking about, not a picture book. So, is the game itself fun? Eh. A lot of this game comes down to doing the same thing every level. You run around an environment looking for something while being chased by the spooky monster of the level. Ultimately, this formula isn't too bad and works for like 60% of all horror games ever, but having to do it here again and again can vary from kind of boring to downright frustrating. The most egregious out of all of these examples I believe is this stupid maze in Chapter 2, where you need to find a spirit to get to the exit. It'd be easier if the map at the beginning told you where the spirit was, but no, you just gotta aimlessly wander around this huge environment and just hope you stumble across it. This structure of gameplay has led to a lot of these chapters just kind of blending into one in my mind, even fresh off playing it. If I had to give my favorite standout moments though, it'd have to be slowly unlocking this door in the third chapter that would lead to this absolutely grotesque centipede monster that you need to avoid while solving a puzzle. Although the AI of a lot of the ghosts in these aren't the best, I can still appreciate how absolutely chilling some of these designs can be in the right context. These models, when taken out of those contexts though, can look incredibly silly. Especially when the game tries to do these out of nowhere jump scares where your screen just flashes with one for a split second. These kind of jump scares personally never scare me because of how predictable and immersion breaking they are, but in Roblox especially, the fear factor just kinda gets lowered more than it already was. Making our way through the levels and chapters, a little more of the story is also revealed to us as well. From what I got, it really just comes down to our ancestors making a deal with demons long ago, and we are now suffering the consequences of that, and need to break the curse. It's pretty simple to follow, and it's not really all that invasive. All the monsters in this game seem to have a short little backstory for the player to infer while looking around the environment too, which is pretty cool for the people that care to look. Eventually, we get to the last chapter, where we have to fight the final boss with a katana. Alright, look. The fact that we have a boss fight in this game is pretty cool on paper and sounds like a really sweet reward for the player, but it is just not executed well at all. Me and Pastra, who are the ones who were playing it at the time, just ended up mindlessly swinging at it until it dropped, getting killed by its hard-to-pinpoint hitboxes several times in the process. When you do kill it, it gives you two prompts. Choosing to save your parents gets you the bad ending, as you're taken away by the spirit to join your ancestors in torment. Or, you can finally kill the spirit, and you presumably wake up to continue living a normal life. Either way, that was a very short summary of Book 1 of the Mimic. Overall, as one complete game, it mostly held my attention. I absolutely adored the visuals and art direction this game set out in front of us, but the gameplay throughout it all was certainly hit or miss. I also played the first two chapters of the second book, which were also pretty hit or miss most of the time. The visuals are still absolutely beautiful though, and they just keep getting better. And in Book 2, there were a few quality of life changes, such as being able to pick up objects and open doors a lot faster, which I really did appreciate, but overall, it did kind of just come down to the same stuff we've already experienced. But, before we move on from the Mimic, I need to explain a dire mistake I made regarding this game that almost jeopardized the entire review. And it comes down to me somehow not figuring out what game I was actually playing. Alright, strap in for this one. So, to actually play the Mimic, there's this somewhat discreet but noticeable play button that allows you to choose which chapter of the game to play. I didn't see this for my first few times playing the game, and I thought what you actually had to do was access the game through this game modes portal in the menu. This portal leads you to a different lobby with four what I can only describe as expansion packs to the base game. All of them are awful. The Witch Trials were okay, and it felt like it could have just been integrated into the original game, but the Christmas event, Halloween event, and Nightmare Circus were borderline unplayable. The Christmas event was an absolute slog to get through 
playthrough that I dropped after it asked me to find 19 items throughout the map. The Halloween event was probably the most busted in the entire game, as well as literally kicking you out of the game if you fail its objective. And Nightmare Circus had some amazing visuals and animation, but it was an absolute bore to play. And on top of it all, I thought this was all the Mimic had to offer for a good two days. Thank god I found out that there is an actual game there all along, because Jesus Christ, if I never caught that, I would never hear the end of it for the rest of my damn life. But, in conclusion, that was my experience with the Mimic. Certainly a lot more ups and downs than I was initially expecting, but when it really wants to try, it can be one of the most tense and visually impressive Roblox games to have ever been published. And I can certainly understand why so many people wanted me to check this out. But with a new face covered in experience, it's time to check up on two more familiar faces after five months. And I don't know about you, but I think there's one that the majority of us would rather check up on first. After months and a few delays, the Doors expansion Hotel Plus has finally graced our hands. For a few months now. Yeah, I'm particularly late to this one, but I had to wait for more stuff to come out before I just covered this. The changes this update has given to the first chapter of the game have been wonderful, and I can't even imagine going back to play this game in its earlier build anymore. A lot has been changed, reworked, and revamped. On top of the new additions added too, it's really hard to gauge where to start when covering this update, as it's less of an expansion and more of an addition of what we already had. So I'm going to assume you know what's up with doors already, and I'm going to try to just focus on covering the new added content in the Hotel Plus update. For now at least. God knows that's not the only thing we have to cover. If you want a rundown of doors as a game, I made a video a while ago talking about what it was before the new update, so if you feel lost, I'd recommend checking that out first. So now onto the new added content, yeah, a uh, Jesus. The crucifix was added in this update, being one of the first things teased when this got announced. For that, I think this is the most appropriate thing to start off with. This item is very interesting with how it works being a line of defense between you and the monsters that face your way. You're able to use it in a variety of scenarios, being able to momentarily halt entities like Seek and completely get rid of others like Rush or Ambush. All you have to do is hold it out and you'll live your encounter. This item is rare enough to not make it feel that overpowered for as sparingly as it's given to you, but just having that little extra line of defense if all else fails is a nice failsafe if you're lucky enough to have one. The other rare item you can find in this update is the Skeleton Key. It has two uses, but the one we'll be talking about right now is its use on this door around the end game. Unlocking it allows you to enter this little room with a plant, taking a leaf off that gives you a passive regeneration ability. I personally believe something like this would have been way more useful earlier on in the game, as you'd be more likely to be damaged by enemies that won't just one hit kill you. But its implementation is still a welcome one, especially with how rare bandages can be sometimes. The last important item we'll cover right now is the candle, which serves double as a light source and an indicator if an enemy is coming. An example would be it going out in a dark room, notifying you that Screech has spawned. And you can never get enough of more light items because I swear the darkness got a lot more brutal in this update. It could just be because I haven't played this game in a while, but I swear it did not used to be this dark, but I can't say I'm not opposed to it. One thing I was very skeptical about when this update was first announced was the implementation of these new mechanics, as I already felt that the first chapter of Door had a pretty perfect formula that didn't really need much refining. But after having played more rounds after the update than before at this point, I don't think I could imagine going back. And we're not even scratching the surface yet. New entities, but most notably added in this update being dupe. Now, you have a chance of spawning in a room with up to four doors, with only one of them being the correct one for progression. If choosing the incorrect one, dupe will take a huge portion of your health away, so make sure you're keeping an eye on those room numbers. The other entity that we'll talk about right now is Void, who I honestly remembered being in the game since day one, but I guess not. His purpose is to just teleport you back to your party if you lose some in a multiplayer match, taking away a little bit of your health in the process. You have the chance to encounter all of these enemies before you reach door 50, which I have a lot to say about now. First off, I want to applaud the new improved animations done for this game. We get a little taste of this earlier with this much more improved Seek chase intro that absolutely 
absolutely rocks. But I think these improvements really shine with Figure. Figure looks and moves a lot more animalistic with his updated animations. And I think it's also represented in just how this boss fight feels after the update. Figure's pathfinding feels a lot more fair and precise than his old one, which I can't tell if that was actually tweaked or if I have just become a lot more seasoned with the game. Another detail that went completely over my head when I initially reviewed this game as well is that you can hear the books, which when said out loud sounds really stupid, but it's actually an insanely clever mechanic. Obviously, spotting all the correct books in this massive library to end the puzzle isn't a walk in the park for most new players, but you don't actually have to look for all of them. If you listen carefully, you can hear a slight sparkling sound come from the books as you approach them, alerting you of their position. I don't know how common of knowledge this little tidbit is, but after figuring it out for the first time, it made this boss fight so much easier to deal with. My opinions on this section have changed a lot since I first played it. And looking back to my original criticisms, after doing this so many times, it started to just not face me anymore. Just like last time, doors onward from 50 stay practically the same, but at a higher difficulty. But before we head forward on our journey, why not support a local small business? The shop is one of the biggest things added to this update. And with it, two new entities, Jeff, our shopkeeper, and his Hungarian pal, El Goblino. Oh yeah, there's also this guy too, but don't mind him. This place serves more purpose than just being a tension break, though. This is actually the area where you're most likely to get the skeleton key or crucifix. They can spawn naturally, but it's exponentially rare. So if you have the extra set of coins, it might be a good idea to pick at least one of these up before you head on with the rest of your journey. Because after entering door 90, you notice something's a lot different. We seem to have entered a greenhouse environment for these last 10 doors. And let me tell you, these last few are absolutely brutal, with revives being disabled and every room being a dark one. You're in for a challenge to get that ending. Not only do you have to deal with your previous threats in this room, but you also have floor spikes peeking out of the ground that damage you when stepped on. So I hope you grabbed that herb from earlier. It's a treacherous path, but ultimately doable, as we finally get to that industrial element Elevator we remember. And once again, for the love of God, thank you, L Splash. This reworked ending set piece is so much better than the original Door 100, giving you actual room to escape figure as he chases you. But with that added convenience comes a new challenge. Instead of you just waltzing up to the elevator and getting the key to open the panel room, you instead have to collect batteries to power the room you're in, setting it on fire, momentarily getting rid of figure. Here, you do your puzzle panel once more and make a break for it to the elevator, where the chapter once again ends. So, there you go. All the content added to the Hotel Plus update. Oh, god damn it. So remember the skeleton key from earlier? Well, it can be used on more than just that medical room. There's a secret, heavily guarded door that's hidden from your sight that you need not only the skeleton key for, but three lockpicks as well. Opening it all up brings you to somewhere pretty special. Now, I gotta give a little history lesson for this one. Back in 2020, a Roblox horror game about traversing randomly generated, identical rooms that would progressively get darker and more dangerous was made. This game obviously being a direct inspiration for Doors, and it would eventually get ported into the game as a secret little tribute to the original. I'll be honest, after playing a little bit of both the port and the original game,
I honestly think rooms is scarier than doors. Now, don't get me wrong. I prefer doors 110%, but rooms is very different in its approach. You thought 100 doors took forever? Well, try 1,000. This times 10 multiplication of the amount of rooms added to what we're used to obviously means I have not beat this game mode, nor do I plan on beating it anytime soon. As to do so takes around two hours, but I'll give a little bit of a rundown of the premise. You have to get to door 1000 while dealing with three unique entities of this realm, A60, A90, and A120. All of these entities work practically like Russian ambush clones, so there's no point in getting into the intricacies of them. You're given another new item in this game mode too, the glow stick flashlight that's from Tattletale of all things. This is because in the original version of Rooms, for 10 Robux, you could buy this item to use in that game, although it absolutely sucked in the original Rooms. The alternative that featured in this port though actually functions pretty well and is implemented pretty neatly. Though, if you for some reason actually feel compelled to beat this challenge, you are given the final item that you can use in this game, a tablet that, when looked through, not only gives you night vision, but also marks every point of interest in a room for you to see. It's a neat reward, but I personally don't see it as something worth getting for how difficult it is to get. But with that, I think I covered everything relating to doors since the last time we checked in. I don't think I miss anything at all, and we can move on. Oh my God. <sighs> So, it's about to be April, meaning the L Splash team wanted to do something a little silly for April Fool's Day. So, in the span of less than two days, Door Super Hard Mode silently dropped. This update is absurd, man. You know, rooms may be too much work of a challenge for me, but spending two days attempting to beat this stupid game mode surely wasn't for some reason. Oh uh, yeah, versus Jeff the Killer. I've done this enough times. <laughs> this game mode lives up to its name, and there's so many reasons why. But first off, general things that you'd expect. The spawn rate of Screech, Rush, Ice, and Dupe has increased tenfold. Ice especially, who practically spawns in every single room you traverse in. But there's also some cosmetic changes, such as Rush having the chance to... not be Rush. Or Figure getting a new color palette. But my personal favorite change has to be Seek's new whip. Outside of small changes, done to already existing entities, we also got new ones too. Notice how in this game mode, there is a lot more money lying around than usual. This would usually be a pretty good thing, but we got Greed, who is a new entity introduced through this update. Basically, if you pick up too much money in a short amount of time, Greed will spawn. When he does, the Kitchen Nightmare Sting will play as he starts to take up more of your screen. If he gets too big, he will kill you. The other character introduced in this update is none other than Jeff the King. Killer. And let me tell you, he is the absolute bane of my existence in this game mode. Jeff has the chance of spawning any time you open a door, and if he spawns, that usually means a dead run. Unless you got the Holy Hand Grenade. This item works on almost every entity in the game. Yes, even figure. And you better hope that you have one of these, because otherwise... What am I even looking at? Yeah, the lock in this mode doubles to 10 characters, so good luck trying to solve that with figure moving about. Getting out of there, your experience will practically be the same until you get to door 100, where figure didn't feel like being animated for today. Beating this mode during the event would have gotten you an exclusive badge, but even though you can still play it on private servers, the ability to get the badge has since been taken away. Say, what would happen if we tried to enter the rooms for this game mode? Uh... Okay. Yeah, let's let's not look at my score in this game. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a good time to move on. Welp. We made it, the most out of left field announcement to finally get a release. I made my opinion on Rainbow Friends very known in my first time covering chapter one. And yes, although I still think you'd have to be an embryo to not know what to do in this game, looking back, I could have never predicted what would come in its wake. So that makes me question, was I too hard on this game? Nah, I wouldn't say so. I still don't like it, even on top of everything else that happened. And for a while, I thought this is where Rainbow Friends' story would have concluded 
concluded. The market moved on. The devs of this game would just keep riding their success through gambling boxes, and that would be it. Until this tweet came out of absolute nowhere. So Rainbow Friends Chapter 2 is real, and it already came out. Going in, I obviously had very low expectations. The first chapter of Rainbow Friends was so unashamedly boring that I couldn't fathom what else could even come from it. So I got a few buddies with me, and we ended up playing it day of. <sighs> Would you take me seriously if I said it wasn't that bad? Okay, you just need to hear me out with this one. Because I think some of the things this chapter does genuinely improve on what we were initially given. First off, the environment. We're put in a theme park area this time around, and surprisingly, it has a lot of interactivity. My biggest complaint about the map of chapter 1 is that it felt way too samey. A lot of the environments looked identical to each other, with nothing to really do in them. If the devs listened to any criticism by the detractors of their game, I think this is the thing they took and implemented. Rainbow Friends now has a very distinguishable visual style, with a lot of textures in this game looking to be hand-drawn, which kind of gives it this weird PS2-era 3D platform look to it that I actually really dig. On top of that, the theme park actually feels like a theme park, with you being able to do everything from ride the Ferris wheel, ride go-karts, use a zipline, and even ride the big roller coaster at the end of the chapter. Although a lot of these features are super small and don't matter to the actual core of your objective, it's still really cool that it was implemented here. No joke, no exaggeration at all, this environment genuinely immerses me into itself more than the Pizzaplex did in Security Breach. Obviously, that isn't to say this game is perfect now, far from. Your objective on what to do is still the exact same from the last game. There's items around the map, you gotta go find them. That's still the meat of the gameplay. And it's still not that fun. It can be if you only only play it like once, but having to play it five times for this video, the novelty wore off really fast. Despite that, I'll still say its execution was better here than in the first game. This comes down to the changes made to the AI of the original characters, as well as the implementation of two new faces, Yellow and Cyan. The first phase of this game has us enter the theme park, helping this guy collect lights to activate the blue signal. While we're doing this, three threats are already active, blue, green, and purple who is restrained to only one portion of the map this time around. Blue and green function the exact same way that they did in Chapter 1. But one compliment I will give is the improvement on the animation. The cutscenes look really good for Roblox standards, and all of the characters move pretty fluidly. As mentioned previously too, their pathfinding feels like it has gotten a lot smarter, and just simply running away from them doesn't seem to work every time like in the first chapter. This has actually caused me to genuinely be killed a few times because I was too careless and not paying enough attention. Do I think this game is a little bit more challenging because of this change? Yeah, but not by much. This is how I feel Chapter 1 should have played already, and it certainly still can be improved on. But it is a big step in the right direction, and I can certainly admit that. Night 2 has us trying to collect batteries to power this drill to open a closet. This phase is the one where one of our new characters is introduced, Yellow. Yellow functions very differently from any other monster in this game. He doesn't simply kill you like all the other ones do, but what he does is pick you up and flies you to a nest to be killed. But if timed right, you can break free from his grasp and drop down to safety in the bouncy castle below. Meaning if you're skilled enough, yellow could be used as a means to traverse the map or get you out of a not-so-savory situation. Eventually, powering up the drill, we use it to open this door, and that's not how a drill works. But when the door does bust open, it sends all these little guys flying out, and in the process, knocks the man helping us out, waking up on top of a dropper rigged with explosives, meaning we're on a time limit to complete our next objective. Except not really. The time limit is absurd, like a good 15 minutes, meaning that you'd have to try to run out of time to actually run out of it. And if you do, it doesn't end your game either. You're just given this unique cutscene, which admittedly is pretty funny, and you just continue on with your game. I don't know why a timer was included for this part, other than to just create a false sense of urgency, but I don't really care either way. It doesn't really affect much of anything. This phase is also where our second and final character is introduced to 
Cyan. Cyan is absolutely hilarious. I love this character design. She functions about the same as Blue, but is a little smarter than him. If you box near her, you can't move, as she'll sniff the box you're in, and if you spark suspicion, you'll be jump scared. When all these guys are active, it can make for quite a challenging endgame. That still doesn't really feel that bloated because of how big the map is this time around. Grabbing these little guys named Lookies, our next objective is to collect sugar packets to bake a cake for this giant lucky to move out of the way. After watching it roll, we're able to walk through the entrance of the roller coaster, where this game does something very different. This is a huge step up from the final night of chapter one. The transition to the big set piece of this chapter actually feels very genuine, instead of just being teleported to a new area of the map like we were last time. And although it's debatable if this section is actually fun, I gotta hand it to the devs for actually making something pretty memorable. We went from having one of the worst imitations of what is arguably the most iconic mascot horror chase sequence ever, to our final set piece being a freaking roller coaster ride, which is so much more original and cool than what came before. Our job here is to just simply lean our cart in the correct directions so as to not get caught by one of the monsters. You can actually have up to two people in a cart at a time, but just make sure you trust the person you allow in with you, as you don't know if they'll screw you over while going through this area. That scenario is very very unlikely though, if not done intentionally. That's where my biggest criticism comes in with this part. There is zero reaction time needed at all to go onto the correct track. It gives you like a good five second window to make the correct decision, which I personally feel is way too generous. But I still gotta take in consideration who this game is made for, so I guess it makes sense. Getting to the end of the roller coaster ride, we get chased down by Cyan and escape through some pillars, which Cyan in response just gives up up immediately. I love this character. And then chapter two ends. I don't really know what I just played, but I didn't hate it. Look, the bar was already on the floor. So whatever this game was going to do, I believe was going to be better than what came first anyways. But there's still a lot of parts of this experience that really did subvert my expectations. If the creators behind this game continue to keep this up, I would be all here for it. I feel this game deserves to have its place in the market taken back from someone else who we're all familiar familiar with. So if this trend continues with the next few chapters of these games, I'll be cheering them on. Man, a lot changes in five months, doesn't it? It's weird to think how the foundations of this niche of horror were completely changed with the introduction of some of these games. And with them not seeming to have any signs of stopping soon, I think I'm gonna be a bit more optimistic about my outlook on these guys. Are Rainbow Friends or The Mimic absolutely perfect games with no faults just because I liked some aspects of them? No, of course not. But with Rainbow Friends in particular, it's nice to see some things done differently this time around, especially when they absolutely absolutely did not have to and would have gotten their money regardless. I'm really curious as to what else is to come from this renaissance of horror made in this engine, and I'll definitely be keeping a keen eye on whatever else comes out that may pique my attention. But anyways, I think we have seen everything we've needed to for today. 10 likes and I'll make an hour-long documentary about the official Roblox Garden of Banban -Ban ports. I've been Dags, and until next time, see ya. Huggy Wuggy Seek, Scary Blue, um, Zumbo Sauce, Ban Ban, um, Nab Nab, um, I forgot his name, the Frog Dude.